Now, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker. I'm so pleased that she's opening up the series for us. Minna Anderson is our speaker tonight, and her enthusiasm for history and her storytelling skills will bring this evening's story about our first limery, Nellie, truly alive. Uh, Minna is really a wonderful speaker, and I know some of you will have encountered her before. She's a hugely requested speaker on all things London, so we're delighted to have her kick off this series with, some, with something that she's really passionate about, Nellie Ionides and the Orleans House Gallery. Over to Minna. Well, thank you very much. I am absolutely delighted and honoured to be starting this series and kicking, kicking this off. And my passion for our first luminary is, is absolutely, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's bottomless. So uh, as we start now our, our series here, uh, if we can have the first slide of our outside, outside room. Um, here we have, th this, is, this is probably something that you have seen. This is the Orleans house, but before we get to this point, we have to travel back in time for 300 years. So how our story started is, it started from a gentleman called James Johnston. James Johnston was a very prominent politician in the beginning of 1700s, uh, end of 1600s. And then when he retired from politics, he started to look for a place where it would be a sort of best possible retirement area for him. And he really didn't have to look very far when he found Twickenham because this stretch of the river between uh, Richmond to Hampton Court really was the place where first of all, our series will take place. I mean, throughout the week, you hear stories from this stretch of the river. And this is also then where James Johnston decided to retire. This stretch of the river, I always say that it's like, it was like the Sloan Avenue of the day. That's where everyone just sort of wanted to be if they had the wealth, if they wanted to be seen, and if they wanted to see, it was here around Twickenham. So James Johnston then on the left hand side you can see he built a or had a rather modest house built. He had his uh, fellow Scottish architect John James built a modest house and uh, he was also a really prominent gardener and Daniel Defoe beginning of 1700s uh, he was the Daniel Defoe of Robinson Crusoe fame he said that James Johnson was the best gardener of whole of England. And that was quite something. He managed to grow his own vines. So he made his own wine there. There, there was a vineyard and there's a wine cellar under, underneath the octagon room. But James Johnston, he didn't quite manage to retire 100%. He still kept his little finger uh, in, in the politics. And he went to the continent in, in, in the beginning of 1700s. He happened to make friends with a German prince from Herrenhausen, Hanover, called George. And he knew that there might be a possibility that this prince will become a king of England one day. So he returned back home and he thought that, okay, well, uh, this, this new king is about to arrive I need something more substantial to entertain this new king. That this plain house was absolutely too plain. That the, uh, the, the Germans, they were uh, used to in something absolutely beautiful, colorful, baroque. And he got an architect, uh, James Gibbs, to do exactly that. He got a James Gibbs to design a room that we call today the octagon room room that was built just purely for entertainment just to entertain it was built separate from the main house and uh, that's where the entertainment happened that was the so the whole seat of the entertainment in twickenham in that time and the most famous guests that was entertained there was this lady queen caroline she was the queen of george the second and it's also said that Queen Caroline was the reason why the entertainment room, entertainment room was built. 
And quite interestingly, we hear tomorrow uh, in Marble Hill House that while uh, um, Caroline, Queen Caroline was entertained in, in our wonderful, wonderful octagon room, her husband was very often the next door, a few hundred meters, meters down, the, down, down, down the road in Marble Hill House where his mistress lived, Henrietta Howard. So it all happened here in Twickenham. This, this, this was the place to be. So as we then, then move, move on, and I have been now talking for quite a while, uh, and I have not mentioned the word uh, audience house. So we then start, uh, if I can get the, get the next slide. If we can now, uh, we look at these two gentlemen and it's down to these chaps why the house is called Orleans House. The gentleman on the left is called Louis Philippe, King of the French. And he was also the Duke of Orleans. He lived in Orleans House for two years during the Napoleonic Wars. Louis Philippe was the supporter of the French Revolution. So he spent most of his life, well, a good part of 20 years in exile. And he visited Twickenham uh, twice, uh, three times and loved his time that he lived uh, and spent in, in, in Orleans House. And he said that, that I love my time in Orleans House in the old Twickenham. So it was his happiest, absolutely happiest time. And then this gentleman on the right hand side is his son, Henri Duc de Marle, who spent uh, about 20 years in Orleans House. And he was a great art collector. So he, as he came from, from France uh, to Twickenham, he brought his massive art collection with him. So we had a huge art collection uh, in the house. He extended uh, the house to really uh, house uh, his, his, his collection in a proper way. So when he then, then, then left, he took his art with him, and that art can be seen now in outside Paris in Chateau de Chantilly, where, where, where it's still, uh, still sort of, uh, it's one of, the, one of the wonderful art collections in, in Paris. So then uh, Louis Philippe, if we get the next slide then, Louis Philippe, uh, he, when he was the, became the king, king, king of the French in uh, 18, 1830, he came to visit the, the old home where he was so happy. And here I think we have one of the most wonderful drawing of the whole of the Orleans house. You can see the octagon room on the left hand side uh, and the main house is, is towards the right. And then there's a link building. And Louis Philippe can be seen with a top hat and brown coat here in the forefront. And he brought Queen Victoria to see his, his home where he was, he was so happy. And uh, Queen Victoria is noted saying that, that the house is very pretty house, much embellished since King lived there. And the King seems so happy to see the house again. And this was probably a little start of the, the, the Entente Cordiale because previous year, Queen Victoria had visited him in France. And that visit was the first visit of an English monarch in France since Henry VIII and Francis I and their famous build of cloth of gold in, in, in uh, 1520. So the uh, Antoine Cordier really happened, ha happened uh, here and it was a really prominent meet, meet here in, uh, in Orleans House. So how about if we now finally get to the main lady? So we have now paved the way. We have now set the scene for our luminary Nelly Ioannidis. And uh, we get her family photo here. I mean, first of all, uh, the family photo is here in, in, in the, the center photo. Nelly is standing behind her mother in a white, white uh, uh, dress, and they all look rather stern. Uh, I think the sort of portrait photography was just sort of happening at those, uh, the, the, those days. Uh, very popular, but you did not smile. Uh, it, these days we, we say cheese when we, when we have a photo taken. In those days it was said prune. So you had to say prune, so nothing, no teeth showing and you were very stern. But I think sort of the happiness was there because the wealth and, and, and just the sort of sheer inquisitive mind that these children had. 
So a couple of words uh, about Nelly's ancestor. Nelly's uh, grandfather is on the top uh, left-hand corner. And Nelly's grandfather, Marcus Samuel, was actually an extremely uh, interesting, interesting gentleman. Because what he did, he, he tapped into uh, what Victorians loved. What they loved, they loved everything exotic. They loved all the sort of seashells and ostrich feathers. So what uh, Nelly's grandfather did, he started to import seashells from Far East. And what he also did is, uh, was in the beginning that he was hanging out in the east end of London, in the Docklands, and waiting for all the ships as they came uh, from, from, from Far East. And he was buying seashells from the sailors. And he made those then into, into trinket boxes and sold the trinket boxes. Made quite a bit of money. But then the fascination for uh, seashells and also then for Far East stayed with, with Marcus's boys and, and, and sons. And we have here Nelly's, Nelly's father, father, also Marcus. Marcus uh, uh, Jr. Is, is on the bottom left-hand corner. And then, uh, then uh, 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 his brother is on the top, top right-hand corner. But these boys, they uh, loved, the fascination for Far East was, as I mentioned, quite, quite prominent. But what they did, they started to tap on bringing oil in, in tankers. Because those days the oil was uh, transported in barrels. Uh, it was very cumbersome. The barrels leaked. Uh, they took a lot of space. So what Nelly's father then actually uh, came up with is to design an oil tank. Oil tank that was large, but also safe enough to sail through Suez Canal. And Nelly was seven years old when she was in Hartlepool with her mother, witnessing when her father, the, the, the oil tank that her father designed, sailed off uh, and, and was the first oil tanker to go through Suez Canal. The name of that tanker was Murex. And then they uh, commissioned 10 other tankers. And the, Nelly's father named all the tankers they came names uh, after seashells. There were sort of uh, cochins, and there were clams, and there were seahorse. They were all, na all named after seashells. And the name of their trading company became known as Shell Trading and Transport. And that was the start of the Shell Oil Company, as we know today. So that was Nelly's, Nelly's father was, was uh, and, and together with Nelly's, Nelly's brother, they started the Shell Oil Company. And uh, the Shell is there uh, as a memory of, of, of the, the grandfather. And then sort of just a few words, Nelly's, Nelly's brother there and the bottom, bottom right hand corner. Uh, Walter then was a, um, uh, uh, chairman of Shell and also a very prominent art collector. He was a, uh, he sat in a board of uh, National Gallery and Tate Gallery. And uh, so, so the family had huge wealth, huge inquisitive mind and this inquisitive mind to collect. So it started from grandfather and carried on through Nelly's life. So if we then get to the next, next slide, because then Nelly falls in love and uh, gets married. Gets married to a gentleman called Wal Walter Levy uh, in uh, 1902. They got married in Mansion House. Nelly's father was the uh, Lord Mayor of London. And uh, Lord Mayor of London lives in the Mansion House in the in, in, in City of London. So that was the first wedding of its kind to happen in the uh, Egyptian room in Mansion House. And it was a society wedding. It was sort of uh, uh, announced in all newspapers and how she wore orange blossoms in her hair and, uh, and all the jewels, which were, how she was sort of uh, carrying her jewels. So it was a sort of big, big wedding. Uh, Walter uh, was serving and, and was serving in the First World War. He got quite badly injured in the trenches of Flanders, and uh, then subsequently he sadly died of those injuries in 1923. 
So Nelly's life moves on and, uh, and he, she falls in love. And you might, might think that, what on earth, we have a cat there. Uh, Nelly's second husband, uh, Basil, uh, was uh, actually uh, is someone that we actually haven't managed to locate a photo of Basil. And I will come, come back to the cat because that is quite, quite important and that really ties in Nelly's second husband nicely. Basil um, was an other collector. Basil was, uh, first of all, Basil Ioannidis, where Nelly's, Nelly's surname comes. Basil Ioannidis was, uh, uh, his grandfather was a um, Greek ambassador to London. Basil's ancestors, a great grandfather and grandfather, they were, they loved artist scenery. They were friends with Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Burne Jones, Whistler. Nelly's aunt was a muse for William Morris. Uh, uh, Basil's aunt was a muse for William Morris. So again, Basil grew up in this wonderful, wonderful uh, art society. And, uh, and so when these two met, they actually met when uh, Nelly was looking for someone to decorate her house in Berkeley Square in London. So a friend of hers uh, suggested Basil, because Basil in his own right, he was a um, uh, interior decorator. He was a art deco designer and he wrote books. He was a color the theorist. And I have a wonderful first edition book of his color theory, Color in Everyday Room uh, from 1936, which he has dedicated to Nelly. And uh, I just find th this book even smells lovely. So this is sort of a, the Basil's, Basil's uh, uh, legacy is, is that he, he was a color the theorist. So Nelly and Basil fell in love because what connected them was collecting. And uh, before we move further, I need to say a few words about this cat, because Basil's uh, fav famous uh, uh, works are the interior design of Claridge's Hotel, which is one of the five-star hotels in London, interior design of uh, Savoy Hotel and Savoy Theatre, and then this fabulous cat called Kaspar. Kaspar the cat. And what happens with Kaspar is that there's a huge superstition in Savoy Hotel that if you are a party of 13 people and you want to go dining in Savoy Hotel, they think that uh, it's too superstitious. That uh, that party of 13, they, they, don't, they don't like to have that. But they place Kaspar the cat as a 14th dining member to sit at the head of the table so that uh, the superstition doesn't, doesn't come through and uh, there will never be 13 dining members. So Casper the Cat is still, uh, you can see him all over, the, all over the hotel if he is not doing his duty and, 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 and uh, sitting at the head of the table. So, uh, so that is, that is um, uh, our, our Basil. So Nelly and Basil get married uh, in 1930 and uh, they, as I mentioned, what connects them is this absolute deep love of old houses, saving old houses, salvaging them. So they bought Buxted Park in Sussex. And uh, what they did then uh, after the war and even during the war, that a lot of bombed out uh, stately homes uh, that were scattered around the country. Nelly and Basil went up and down scavenging those country houses, looking for pieces of, of uh, prominent, prominent pieces, of whether it was a door frame or doorknob or cornice, whatever they could get their hands, in, uh, hands onto, they brought it back and they furnished uh, and, and, and re uh, decorated Buxt Buxted Park. Buxted Park was the seat of, uh, of, of entertainment. They loved entertaining. Queen Mary and uh, King George V stayed there. They were entertained there. Winston Churchill came to visit them. So it really was, they, they, they really uh, loved, loved having all this, all this uh, fabulousness around them. And then uh, in, in the 60s, Buxted Park was sold 
And for all the locals here in Twickenham, this might be quite interesting because who bought it then was a gentleman called Kenneth uh, Shipman, who was the owner of Twickenham Film Studios. And the parties continued in Buxted Park, but then the clientele and the, and the party people were the likes of Marlon Brando and Gregory Peck and Dudley Moore. Today, uh, Buxted Park uh, uh, is a hotel. So, so it still carries on sort of being a fabulous, fabulous part, party, party, party place as well. So then we come very close to home and we bring ourselves to, to we are now in Twickenham. We are now in, the, in, in um, looking at Riverside, Riverside House, which was the house that Nellie bought at the end of uh, 1920s. She loved this area. She spent a time here with her first husband on honeymoon. And she bought the house uh, at the end of, nine, well, 19, 1928, 1920, end of 1920s. And the reason I wanted this photo there is that you can see how close to it is to Orleans House and the octagon room. In the black and white photo, you can see the octagon room right at the back. So it was literally, it, it, it were, it, they, they were touching each other. So what happened then, uh, Basil did the interior decoration, uh, de decorating uh, for, for the, for the uh, Riverside house as well. But then tragedy happened. And uh, here we have two photos. First of all, on the left hand side is a photo. You can just about see on the left, you can see the uh, octagon room and the whole house, how, how large it was. And the photo on the right is, is a photo taken on nine, in 1926, when the whole area was sold for gravel merchants to excavate gravel. As it is the case of many grand houses, you really need to give them tender love and care and a lot of money to keep them looking, looking uh, uh, wonderful. And this wasn't, wasn't the case. It's changed hands. It was an orphanage. It was uh, a, a sports, uh, sports, sports hall. And then finally, as I mentioned in 1926, it was sold to excavate gravel. Nelly was horrified. She lived next door and she couldn't believe her eyes. She just couldn't, couldn't believe. We already know that she had saved one house, the Buxted, Buxted Park, and this was happening on her doorstep. And she knew that if the gravel merchants, merchants uh, and the gravel diggers had their way, the fabulous view from up in Richmond Hill the only, uh, um, uh, uh, only view in this country that is protected by the Act of Parliament uh, of 1902. So Henelli knew that if they had their way, the view would have been gone and we would have high rise buildings and it would not be the same. So she fought, she was passionate. passionate. She, 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 she believed in, in, in what she wanted and she really went for it. And guess what? She really managed to save the whole, whole house. Not quite, because the, the main house already was demolished, but she managed to save the octagon room, the James Gibbs octagon room from 1720. The octagon room, which was built to entertain Queen Caroline, the queen of, of George II. So what we know now of, of Nelly, uh, she had bought the octagon room and she, she carried on having dinner parties there. There was no kitchen there because it all was dem demolished. So all the foods were prepared in the, in the uh, uh, neighboring uh, Riverside house. And then they were carried uh, into octagon room. And look at this, it, it was sort of, this, this is from 1940s, 1944. And uh, her, uh, Collecting skills now also then come, come, come to the element. If you look at really on the right hand side, you might be able to see a glass cabinet. And that glass cabinet is filled with porcelain because Nelly was a collector of porcelain. She, uh, she became known, here we have a couple, couple of pieces. Uh, the, the, the piece on the, on the right hand side was sort of sold in um, Christie's and uh, the snuff box in the middle from mid 1700s in, in, in Christie's. 
she became one of the most uh, well-known and loved and most respected collectors of porcelain. So, so uh, well-known uh, that even the Oriental Ceramics Society came to visit Nelly in, in Riverside House here in Twickenham in 1947 to just to sort of see what she has managed to get her hands, hands on. And uh, she was really, really widely uh, uh, respected in that field. So who then also respected her, her collecting skills was Queen Mary. Queen Mary loved mice and porcelain. Queen Mary and, and Nellie had actually become friends and, and, and uh, Nellie was Queen Mary's friend and confidant. And uh, um, Queen Mary, we, we know her from history that it said that Queen Mary, she wound her way around country houses in England vacuuming up the mice. And, but the true, truth is that uh, all the aristocratic uh, families, they knew that Mary always knew if there was sort of a new piece of uh, mice uh, popping up somewhere. So she made sure that she sort of, uh, uh, everyone knew that she possibly wanted to see that piece. And that was the case that when she came to, came to River, Riverside House, uh, Nelly is known to have put away uh, hit all her favorite uh, pieces of porcelain because if, if, if Queen Mary saw it and said that, oh, I like that, it meant that that piece had to be so, uh, sent to Buckingham Palace and Nelly really didn't like that. Interestingly also, Queen Mary and, and Nelly were such uh, good friends that uh, Queen Mary invited uh, Nelly to the coronation of Elizabeth II in 1953. Queen Mary sadly died just a few months before, but Nellie sat in Queen Mary's box in Westminster Abbey. And uh, here we have uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Princess Elizabeth with, with her grandma, Queen Mary on the, on the right hand side. So uh, that, that is sort of wonderful, a wonderful little, little piece, a piece, a piece of uh, uh, history there on our doorstep. And Nellie's collecting skills and passions don't end there. So what else did she do? What else can she do? She loved dogs. She loved dogs and she especially loved poodles. And uh, she founded a kennel called Vulcans. And, uh, and she had between 60 and 100 uh, poodles or then the Griffon, uh, Brussels Griffons in, in, in her kennels both here in Twickenham and in Buxted Park in, in Sussex. And not only that, she also uh, uh, founded a, um, a kennel maid school for kennel maids. And yesterday I had a pleasure of having afternoon tea with, uh, with um, Nellie's granddaughter, uh, Lady Camilla. And Lady Camilla told that Nellie uh, uh, bought a hearse for her dogs. Apparently poodles are very prone being motion sick. So they didn't like being transported. They, they got motion sickness. And nearly drove them from, from uh, uh, dog show to dog show. And she had to somehow sort of figure out a way that her dogs wouldn't get motion sick. So she bought a hearse. And that hearse was not, no, nothing else, no, 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 no less than a Rolls Royce. So her dogs were sort of being driven around in a Rolls Royce purse around the country. I mean, uh, 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 what a passion uh, do we have there. So um, uh, then if we sort of just move, we are nearly to the end because Nelly is then one of her eccentric hobbies was, uh, you can only have an eccentric hobby when you have a like, life like that. Her eccentric hobby was that she loved weaving poodle wool into tweed, fine tweed. And then she took that to Savile Row in London and had suits and overcoats made for her grandsons. And here is her great grandson, Samuel Gosling, uh, modeling one of uh, poodle hair suits made by Nelly's, Nelly's poodles, talking about a uh, hair of the dog. So this is a completely, completely different aspect to that. And then just to sort of uh, to gently follow up on the, on, on, on the poodles, because 
how wonderful is this photo? On the left hand side, we have Nelly with her favorite poodle. Nelly also uh, uh, named all her poodles after her favorite brands of champagne. She loved champagne, loved poodles, why not connect those? Here she is with her favorite poodle, favorite brand, uh, Clicquot. And on the right hand side is her great grand granddaughter Georgina. And Georgina carries on with this, uh, this, this old tradition that Nelly started. So she, is, she got together with a London fashion designer, um, Marco Matsik, and they are carrying on with this uh, old uh, tradition of making poodle hair belts and dog collars and, and, and bags and, 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 and so on. So we are coming nearly, nearly to the end. So here we are. We have, we have gone through the circle. We have come now where we started. I took you through 300 years of, uh, of history. On the left hand side is the photo from about 1944, when you can see that it needed a lot of tender loving care. That's what we have given. We have given the octagon room a new lease of life. It's, uh, uh, we had 3.7 million pounds of lottery heritage fund. And two years ago we reopened and, and, and it looks absolutely stunning. Um, when Nelly died in 1962, she left this for us, for us to look after make sure that it stays open for the nation. Not only did she leave this for us, she left 420 pieces of paintings for us. And that, uh, create, that, that's, that was the nest egg for the, the, the Richmond Borough Art Collection, which we are the home of, and today we have over four and a half thousand paintings there. Plus, Nelly left her, her porcelain collection to the Victorian Albert Museum and um, British Museum and also Brighton Pavilion. So we can only uh, thank Nelly for what she has done. It is a th thriving cultural and heritage, heritage hub. And, uh, and uh, I think the last photo there, if, what would Nelly do? What would Nelly do? Well, first of all, uh, this is the enfilade. And this I think so beautifully capsulates uh, Nelly. We are looking in from the steps of the garden, through the octagon room, through into the gallery, enfilade that is this unobstructed view when the doors are open, suits of rooms which align with one another. And this I think capsulates Nelly's life. So what would Nelly do? Nelly would crack open a bottle of champagne, Sorry, I'm getting all emotion. Here we are. And Nelly would pour a, a glass of her favorite Veuve Clique, Clico, and uh, this, this enfilade, enfilade of, of uh, uh, legacy that is Nelly's, an un unobstructed view of her life, an unobstructed vista that she has left for us in terms of Orleans House Octagon Room. And thank you, Nelly. Cheers to everyone. And cheers uh, to you too, Mina. That was uh, that was fantastic. I will have a sip now. Ah, yes. I'm I'm really sorry that I can't be with you to <laughs> share the champagne. I I raise an invisible glass too. I'm very fond of champagne myself. Fantastic. What a what a what an amazing speaker you are. And uh, I think you you really brought to life that beautiful space and also the fantastic people who have lived in it. Now I'm, I've got a few questions already and I'm sure I've got some questions myself I want to ask but while I um, get the questions ready I just want to remind people about the the chat function. Um, if you move your, uh, your cursor around on your screen you should either at the top or the bottom depending on your device see a row of, of options and one of them is a little sort of square speech bubble called chat and if you send a chat to me and my name is, is Judith Hawley um, it will come up on my screen and I'll be able to, to ask the question to Minna. So I've got uh, several questions so far Ooh. and um, I would like to ask them in, uh, in 
chronological order because as you said towards the end of your talk you've covered about 300 years of history and the questions that have come in are, are um, go through that history right up to the to the present so our first question is about the wonderful octagon room can you tell us some more about how if at all the octagon room has changed since 1720 and what was done during the restoration what has changed uh, since the 1720 is that as, as you mentioned the it was built away from the main house and it was built within the kitchens because the kitchens were always built away from the house because of the fire risk so the octagon room was an entertainment space so it was built next to the next to the uh, uh, kitchens and then what changed then is that uh, subsequently in 1750 it was linked it was safe enough to link link the octagon room with the with the main main house and then it's just sort of it became a more sprawling uh, uh, estate and uh, so what uh, changed now then uh, in, in the restoration because it really needed a lot of money and we were lucky enough to have 3.7 million. Uh, well, first of all, it was all cleaned. We, we, uh, uh, the gold gilding is 23 and a half carat gold. Mm -hmm. The last half is tin because then when tin and gold are mixed, it's, it's easier to mold and it, it just shines, uh, shines and, and lasts longer. And also then the chandelier was re remade, the panini painting uh, was, was, was re redone actually sort of completely from scratch, so it's not original panini. And uh, it, it, it became a vibrant hub to do what it was originally built to do, to have fun, weddings, celebrate and parties. Yes, so the space as it is now looks pretty much as it would have done. 1750. Absolutely. I, 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 I think the, the owners from Seven, yeah. if they came, they would sort of be very much at home. Good, good. Um, now, there, there also is there's a question about um, Nellis uh, house next to the Old Orleans house, uh, Riverside house. Uh, whatever happened to Riverside house? Well, the Riverside house was in Nellie's, uh, that, that, that was where she lived until she died in, in uh, 1962. And then today, it, that is where Nellie's granddaughter lives. So, so it, Gary, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, uh, it is in the family. So, uh, uh, and, and a beautiful house, and as I mentioned, interior decoration done by Nellie's husband, the famous art deco designer, Basil. Ah. Wonderful. There's some other questions about uh, Nella's family and her relationship to Shell and the Shell fortune. Uh, the first question about it is um, something, and I, I thought this too, uh, that, that Shell is a Dutch company. What's the connection between the... connection was that Nelly is... Um, good, 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 good point, good question. Because Nelly's father... Um, Found it with 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 the brother, the Shell Transport and Trading Company, and then I don't have the exact uh, what was it then sort of beginning of 1900s when it then merged with the Dutch arm of it and became whatever it's now officially Dutch Shell Dutch uh, Oil. So it is the foundation was in in uh, in uh, Nelly's Nelly's family mm -hmm. and then it merged. Yeah. With you're absolutely right. Yes, good. And thinking more about um, Nella's relationship to the Shell Company, um, somebody's asked whether um, she had any involvement with the Shell Company, whether the, they... Uh... As, as I am aware, she didn't. Mm. It was her father and her uncle who were then. Her uncle was, was then uh, the chairman uh, of, of, of Shell. And as far as I am aware. I, I would need to double check this, but it has never crossed my my uh, uh, where my, my my sort of vision that uh, Nelly was in any way involved in. in right, that. right, right. But did that's very interesting. And and did her um, her her money from the for her wonderful collections come through Shell or were there other sources as well? 
far as I understand, it came from the inheritance from her, uh, from, from her parents, from her, from her father and, and uh, from that side of the family. Right. And there was, there was presumably some from Ionides himself. And, and did, I, did I Basil also had had a quite a wealth himself. So, uh, so his his parents were uh, or grandparents were the ambassadors to to London, and they were uh, art dealers, and uh, and and they had sort of substantial substantial art collection. And Nelly's uncle actually uh, donated eighty seven paintings to Victor. Mm -hmm. So, and there actually is a Nionides room there, so uh, in, in Victoria and Albert. So, so it, it was all sort of uh, art uh, uh, backgrounds there. Good. Um, and also, there's a question about another, the other amazing aspect of, of Nella's life. Um, can you say a bit more about her school for kennel maids? Okay. <laughs> can you imagine sort of school for kennel maids? Okay, she started this sort of. Uh, from 1930s and it ran throughout until her death and I actually sort of uh, wrote because there's, there, there's a book published, a little booklet published in 1930s. The booklet that was given to the parents of the girls who were the kennel maids and uh, it gives sort of like a, like a sort of a, a good kennel maid has to have plenty of patience, a quiet, a quiet temperament and of course have a, 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 a true love of dogs. And uh, it's then mm -hmm. a daily routine, starts at 7 a.m., finishes 7 p.m. Exactly what you do, you start with breakfast, you take the puppies out and you walk them on a lead and you feed them. And uh, the weekly cost was three guineas. And it was board and lodge. And uh, if you didn't behave, you were sent home. So it was like, like a boarding school for uh, well-behaved and well-temperate, uh, quiet girls, is what the 1930s booklet advertisement, I think, I think of, the, of the kennel maid school. And it also then says that uh, right. you, are, you, are, you are very likely to have a job uh, in another kennel, even become a vet after a bit, bit more studying. So uh, it, was, it was a bit like sort of a, finishing school for, for girls who uh, loved dogs. Well, I want to, to thank you, Minna, and I, I, the various sort of applause emoticons and lovely messages coming up mm -hmm. um, in the chat to, to thank you very much. Yeah. And there are talks through the rest of the week. Um, Henrietta Howard at Marble Hill, Horace Walpole at Strawberry Hill, um, some weird person is going to be talking about Pope and his villa. I don't know why. Um, Sir John Stone and Turner's House. Orleans House Gallery is an amazing, wonderful place to visit, with, which does so much good cultural work. And you can follow Orleans House at all those different um, social media websites. And if you have not already given as much as you, you want to to Orleans House, do please go onto their, their website and um, press the ka button and uh, help uh, Nelly's legacy live on into the future. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much. It has been absolutely my absolute honor and privilege to be able to share this with you. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>